Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Historical Commission Speaker Series speaker for today. Today, we're pleased to have Robin Young, and she is the author of a book up here called Women in Penn's Woods, and she's going to talk about uh, women in Pennsylvania. Um, and she is the Pennsylvania State Coordinator for the Natural Votes uh, for Women Trail. And um, Robin, take it away. <laughs> what you do. Thank you, Don. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? This is a microphone I'm not used to. Okay, um, thank you for having me today, and I just want to share with you my journey in women's history. It started in 1994. I took a trip to Seneca Falls, New York, with a group of women from Chester County. It was the local NAL chapter, and we went with the... Uh, with the Montgomery County chapter. And so this is a, the, a picture of the mill at Seneca Falls. And um, this is Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home. It's a photograph of her original home. And she was the organizer of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention, which was held in Seneca Falls. This is what the house looks like. This was my photo from 1994. And it's been restored. And Susan B. Anthony, we took a side trip to Rochester, New York, to visit Susan B. Anthony's home. She only liked to be photographed from the left. <laughs> and that's her home. And the history of women's suffrage, written in 1881, uh, was written in the third floor of that house. And this is the Wesleyan Chapel. This was the site of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls. It's been completely restored now that when I was there, that was all that, that was done. The walls are all filled in now. And this is the Women's Hall of Fame, also in uh, Seneca Falls. And when you go in there, they have life-sized uh, bronze statues of um, a lot of the attendees that were at the convention. This one is um, Martha Wright, who was Lucretia Mott's sister. Lucretia Mott was from Pennsylvania and she was always going up to New York to work with the Seneca Indians. She was on the Indian Committee of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, which is the big umbrella of Quakers in this area. But this photograph shows Martha Wright six months pregnant, which was the first time I had ever seen a statue of a woman pregnant. And I had circled that statue, and the belly is all shiny because everybody touches it. I was doing research for my book, and I came across this statue, which is in uh, Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. And this is Elizabeth Thorne, who was six months pregnant. And she helped her father, who was elderly, bury 89 soldiers in the Evergreen Cemetery. People from the town came to help the family uh, bury the men. And they were sickened and couldn't do the job, and they went back to town. So that, this statue is there. It's only been put up in the last, I'd say, eight years. So it was nice to see another statue showing a pregnant woman. And um, this was during the, the war. They lived in the, in the caretaker's house at the cemetery. Her husband was um, in the Union Army. He was not around. And so it was just her and her father, an elderly mother. And uh, the generals stayed in their house. And they were in the basement for a while. And then they went and stayed with other family members. Um, and that was just showing who the sculptor was, and he's since passed away. So when we came back from Seneca Falls, New York, we were driving back in the car, a group of women, you know, and we're all talking, and we said, you know, if women in New York were doing this in 1848, then women in Pennsylvania had to be doing the same thing. So I came back to Chester County, and um, I was on the board of the YWCA in Westchester at the time, and one of the women said, oh, my husband, um, did a reenactment with the Women's Studies Division at Westchester University. Did you know that the first women's rights convention in Pennsylvania was held in Westchester in 1852, four years after Seneca Falls? And I never knew that, so I, um, she invited me over to her house for dinner. And Professor William Morehouse was the um, history teacher at Westchester University, and he served up uh, the uh, woman and I dinner. He came out with an apron on and served us dinner. And they were retiring 
and they were moving to uh, South Carolina. And they gave me two costumes from the play that they did in 1985. And then they gave me the script to the play, and they said, run with it. And so I put an ad in the paper. I asked for a call for actresses. I rewrote the narr narrator parts. And um, we, we did a uh, reader's theater script. And I uh, had 12 women show up to be in the play. And a 13th woman showed up. And she was a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And she said she would like to do a story on what we were doing. And that's how we got started with that. But the first women's rights convention in Pennsylvania, it was held in Westchester because they wanted to have it in Philadelphia. Um, but it was too tame. They decided to have it in Westchester because Westchester was considered radical at the time. <laughs> and this is where they had it at Horticultural Hall. And this is a painting by R Barclay Rubenkahn. And that's what, this is what it looks like today. Um, the Chester County Historical Society is there today. And it's at 225 North High Street. This was the cast that we, you know, we went around and we did the play. We called it Be It Resolved because it was just a series of women making motions for the, um, the right to work, the right to teach. Um, they, didn't, they were even timid to ask for the right to vote back then. That the women in Pennsylvania did. It was included in one of their resolutions. And so that's our group. We traveled around. We did it all volunteer. We didn't get paid. We got donations, and we would split the donations for gas money so we could all get to the different sites where we were doing the performances. All the costumes came from thrift shops. If we couldn't get the zipper up in the back, we would just put a shawl around ourselves. <laughs> and so because it was too expensive to buy real costumes. <laughs> and so after I did all that research on the play, um, and we did it, I was boxing everything up. And I thought, if I put this away, nobody's ever going to remember these women. And so I got this state guide to historical markers. It was published in 2001. And I thought, you know, I'll put in a marker for this women's rights convention. And so I got this the guide. I looked through it. I went right to the Chester County section, and there were uh, 52 markers in here for Chester County. And out of the 52, only one was for a woman, and it was for Indian Hannah, who was the last surviving Lenai Lenape Indian, and she had died in 1802. And I thought, that's it? That's all we have? I was very disappointed. So I went through the whole book and counted up how many markers were in there. And there were 1,669 markers in here, and only 60 for women. So it was very lopsided. And so I thought, I'm going to submit three marker proposals at one time. The first time I did three at once, thinking I'm sure to get one out of the three. So I submitted one for the Women's Rights Convention, and one for Dr. Ann Preston, who was at that convention. And she was one of the first women in Pennsylvania to get a medical degree. And I also submitted one for Ida Ella Ruth Jones, who was the Grandma Moses of Chester County. She did folk art, um, African-American woman, descended from slaves. And I was friends with one of the women who was had married into that family. So they were able to get me a lot of the research. So I submitted all three. And what the criteria has to be, it has to have the national significance to be a Pennsylvania marker. You cannot just have Pennsylvania significance. And that's the hardest thing to prove, is that national significance. The person has to be deceased, and you also have to raise $2,000 for each marker that you get. So I thought, you know, so I submitted the three, and um, they approved all three. So I was really shocked, because I thought I was just going to get one. So then I thought, now I have to raise $6,000. And um, but that's the first one. And this is Dr. Preston. She lived in West Grove at 225 um, State Road in West Grove. And um, her house was used on the Underground Railroad. Um, it had burned in a fire, and they rebuilt it facing the road now. But originally, it was facing the other direction. Uh, she got her degree from the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia. She was among its first graduating class. Everybody tells me, oh, um, Elizabeth Blackwell is the first 
Elizabeth Blackwell was in New York, not in Pennsylvania. She did get an honorary degree from the Women's Medical College later in life. But the last 40 years of Elizabeth Blackwell's life, she lived in England, which I, I never knew till I read her biography. I always thought she was stayed in New York. Anyway, this is um, the, New Gro the West Grove uh, Friends Meeting House, where Dr. Preston is buried. Uh, the meeting house is closed now. And I always try to find where the woman lived and where she's buried, because to a woman, I try to put the marker at a woman's home, because a home is important to women. It's, um, you know, so I try to put it there, not where she worked or where she went to school. And so this is Dr. Preston's marker. Um, can you read it, or is it too small? Okay. Um, I, can, I can't read it from here either. <laughs> but it's, he was a pioneer physician, educator in 1860. The first woman doctor in, in the first graduating class of the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia. Well, the first class, there were, I think there were eight women that graduated in the first graduating class of the 1853. Thanks. Was, yeah. And so then this is Ida Ella Ruth Jones. She was known as the Grandma Moses of Chester County. Some of her art is in the Brandywine River Museum. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's very primitive, like Grandma Moses type paintings. Uh, this is her home. Uh, it's right off of Route 82 in Ursuldin, right outside of Coatesville. Um, and that's how she painted. A lot of people say, oh, her house doesn't look like that. I said, to Ida, that's how her house looks like. And so this is her marker. And you notice the first two words on the top, African-American. The family did not want the words African-American on that marker. And it took us like three or four months to convince the family because they said, well, when people see our grandmother's art, they'll know that she was African-American. We said, well, some people may never go and look up after seeing the marker. They'll never research her, and you're going to miss your chance. And so the family, the younger women in the family, finally agreed that they would add the words African-American. Um, but, you know, it caused a lot of conflict <laughs> with the people that were doing it, because this goes through a review process through the board of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commissions, so many eyes review the text, and I used to spend days writing the text, and then I found out that the state copyrights the text because they do these little magnets, and so they sell these magnets of mark the little markers, refrigerator magnets, so I have about six of them, and um, so they have to c rewrite your text, so now I just write just anything, because I don't waste all that time rewriting it, because they're going to change it anyway. And so that's hers, and um, that's on 82, going towards Unionville as you come out of um, Ursuldin. And then um, I belong to the Fallowfield Friends Meeting, and one of the women there is uh, June Webster, which she used to own Webster's store across the street there. Uh, she said, oh, don't you know about Dr. Sitterly? And I said, no. And so they took me over to the library in the meeting house. And there was a three-ring binder there that the kids from the Sunday school class had prepared, and it had everything about Dr. Sitterly in there. She was a phys physicist, an astronomer, and in the 60s, she was picked at one out of six women, and, and the six women picked out of 25,000 women to get the first federal woman's award from the United States government. And that was her house, right across from the Fallowfield Meeting House. She was also a Quaker, and that's her. She was a little tiny thing, and uh, she married, never had children. And in doing all these markers for women, I have 29 markers now, and I used to think, oh, these men, they have everything. You know, <laughs> I really had a chip on my shoulder. But then I realized almost every one of my markers, women were either single and never married, or they were married and never had children. And I think that is why they were kind of forgotten in history. There was no one saying, and my grandmother was somebody really important, or my mother was someone really important. I think they 
they kind of just got le left behind, but not on purpose, by, and not because of men. <laughs> but by the same token, that's probably why they accomplished something. Right, they were married to their careers. They had to be, you know, the, back then, the stuff they went through. And they, this one, she, uh, Dr. Sitterly broke a 149-year tradition, and she was the first woman admitted to the British Astronomical Society. When I saw that newspaper clipping, I knew I would get that marker because she had international recognition at that point. She worked at the Wilson Observatory in California, which is now being made into a museum. And there was a whole issue called Arcs and Sparks. It was dedicated to her by the Union Carbide Company. That was also sitting in the meeting house. And this is her marker. Um, and so it just basically says what I said about her. But I found a little book called Swarthmore Remembered. She, was, she went to Swarthmore College, and um, th it was like a book of essays. And there was one in there that she wrote the essay about going to Swarthmore College. So it was nice to see the writings of the people that I research. This is Grace Anna Lewis from Kimberton, Chester County. Um, their family worked on the Underground Railroad. Grace Anna Lewis um, was a scientist. This is her house. It was on the Chester County, uh, what the towns and tours uh, walks that they have in the summer. And because I was, af I'm, sometimes I'm afraid to go down people's driveway and <laughs> surprise them, you know, when I'm researching a house. So I try to send a letter ahead of time, tell people that what I'm doing. So I'm just glad I got down to the farm to see the house. This was the old barn, and this was the remains of an old iron ore mine. And it kept that farm uh, in supplied uh, and fiscally uh, solvent for years because they were able to produce iron ore. And it, they took it out in wagon loads and took it to the different places to manufacture it. And they also had a huge orchard. They had 52 varieties of apples. Um, but uh, Grace and his father, he died. He caught typhus moving two freedom seekers through Chester County. He died, and then their little infant son died. And so Grace Anna Lewis's mother was left with four daughters to raise. And she sent them all to the Kimberton Boarding School, uh, which is this, it's in Kimberton now. And that's what it looks like today. And actually, on the very end now, there's a little cafe, like a coffee house. But that school was also used on the Underground Railroad. And um, she saw sent all four of her daughters to boarding school. These are botanical drawings done by Grace Anna Lewis. She was commissioned by the state of Pennsylvania to do 50 um, of Pennsylvania's trees. She received a bronze medal at the Louisiana uh, State Exposition. She got another medal for a World's Fair. And this is her marker. It's in Kimberton. When I first submitted this to the, the commission, they rejected it, saying that she was not a scientist. And she wasn't a scientist where she didn't have a science degree in 1845. Women were just starting to get into colleges, so she wouldn't have had a science degree. But she did work at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. She worked with some great men. She was a member of the Delaware County um, Institute of Science, and that's where her papers are. Uh, and so the state rejected my first proposal for her marker. And one day I just happened to be in the Exton Library in the research section. And I looked up and on the top shelf said, Encyclopedia of American Women Scientists. And I thought, oh, I wonder if she's in there. And she was. And so I copied the page and I resubmitted everything to the state and they finally gave me the marker and that's what you see today. And so, um, she was worked on the Underground Railroad also. And so a lot of these people are Quakers, too, which made me think, Quakers are mostly humble <laughs> most of the time. And uh, you know they don't like to look for the spotlight. So maybe that's why a lot of these Quaker women didn't get these markers, or people thought of even submitting for them. Um, Anna Howard Shaw, she lived in Delaware County in Moylan. She was. Um, one of the greatest orators for women's suffrage, um, I think the best. Um, she was friends. She did Susan B. Anthony's eulogy. Uh, she was. She became a minister and then um, became a doctor after that. 
she was, so it was, she was born um, and lived in poverty in like Michigan in the wilderness. Her mother had a nervous breakdown. The father had just deposited the family and went back out to work in a mill and just left them. They d hand dug their well by hand, you know, with the kids were 12 years old. And so by the time she was tw uh, 16, she was teaching in schools. Um, they had come here from England. They emigrated to the United States from uh, England. And so this was a house she bought and lived in with Lucy Anthony, Susan B. Anthony's um, niece. And they were a couple, uh, you know, they were, you know, a gay couple. And so a lot of people uh, say, oh, no, no, Lucy was just her secretary. But they were. And so anyway, she lived there. And this was her mark. She also received um, the Distinguished uh, Women. Distinguished Service Medal during after World War uh, One because the women's suffrage movement stepped in to help because there were uh, they needed to get crops off the field. All the men had gone to war, and the situation was dire with the food in the United States. They were recruiting um, high, high school kids to go get crops off the field. So uh, Anna Howard Shaw asked the women's suffrage movement, and so a lot of the suffragists. They formed what they called the Women's Land Army. And they would go and train at different farms, learn how to milk cows, do the crops. And so she and Hannah Patterson from Chambersburg, to only two Pennsylvania women, to get that medal. Um, they received that, that medal during uh, World War I. Anna Howard Shaw, if you can see, she died in 1919, right before women got the right to vote. So she didn't get to see the success. This is Mildred Scott Olmsted. She lived in Rose Valley um, in Alice Barber Stevens, the artist's old house. It was a barn. They had converted into a house. This is it. This is the back of the house. She had a maid, and this is the maid's quarters. And um, she was the, for 37 years, she was the executive director for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She was born in Glen Olden and lived in Delaware County all her life. Um, and you can see there's a typo in this marker that nobody picked up until the day of the dedication. One of the ladies in the audience said, after Martin Luther King, because they had a lot of peace activists come to their house, it should say Martin Luther King Jr. And nobody in the state, I didn't pick it up. So <laughs> there's a typo in one of them. And so um, she lived there in this house. And when we did the dedication that day, the house was deeded over to the borough of Rose Valley, and they've since made it into a museum. And I said to the family who was present, you know, I could never find where Mildred was buried. Could you tell me where she's buried? And they said, oh, she's buried out in the Rose Garden. <laughs> and so her ashes, and she said, and so are the maid. The maid is the woman she had taken in from a domestic violence center. And the woman was dedicated to her all her life and became her maid. And so they're both buried out in the backyard. <laughs> so you wouldn't know these things unless you ask people, you know. And it's like find a grave. You can't find some of these things sometimes. I was just curious where she was buried. This is Tatiana Praskuryakov. She was a Russian immigrant, came here in uh, the early 1900s with her parents and her sister. Um, and she cracked the Mayan code in Guatemala. This was her house. It's a twin. They lived on the, the right side. The father was a chemist, and the mother was a medical doctor. And uh, they said during Prohibition, the father would make vodka for everybody in the neighborhood. And there was always a line on the side of the house. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting, having a chemist for a father. <laughs> he wouldn't think he would make alcohol. <laughs> so that's their house. And then she worked for the University of Pennsylvania and a couple other museums down in Guatemala doing these uh, interpretations on these stelae, these pillars that depicted um, what this one professor, he had said these were the, like the, about kings and priests. And she's the one that broke the code and said, no, I think these are family trees. These are women on these stelae. Um, I'll show you what they look like. These were her drawings of these. Um, big temples in Guatemala. And so they were interpreting like the drawings on the side, these things. 
And she said, no, these are women. And they said, the professor that was leading this dig for 40 years, he actually published a paper saying he was wrong and she was right. And that was in the 1940s, which was very unusual for a man to do that. But she was always like the only woman on all these digs. She had never married. And her ashes are buried at one of the temples. And she was knighted during her lifetime by the Guatemalan government for all the work she did. And that's her marker. Um, it's on Lansdowne Avenue in Delaware County. Right, uh, see, I don't put the marker in front of the house. I, the, the, it's called the Roadside Marker Program. So the commission likes you to put it on the road so more people can see it, you know. Um, and this is Sarah Josepha Hale. She was the editor of Godey's Ladies Magazine, which is like a Vogue magazine of our day. It depicted women in their costumes. You've probably seen some of these historical prints. I have several. My grandmother had an antique shop, so I have a lot of old stuff. My kids don't want it, but um, I have some of these prints uh, in frames, but some are just in sleeves, you know. I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> but anyway, this one, this, she lived in Philadelphia. And the house on the, the right, the, the maroon door, is where she lived. And so to put a marker up in Philadelphia, you have to raise an additional $400 for a permit just to stand on the sidewalk and have the dedication ceremony. So I try to avoid doing the ones in Philly if I can. And um, that's her, the house. She lived in five different houses. I tried to pick one in a good neighborhood. Some were in really bad neighborhoods because, you know, 1800s. But she was the editor there, and this lady is with one of those cemetery associations in Philadelphia, at Laurel Hill, and they reenact um, the deceased people in the cemetery. And she depicts Sarah Josepha Hale, and so she said, do you mind if I show up dressed as Sarah? And I said, no, I would love it. So she came, and that was us all standing on the, the street, and there's her marker. You notice in the city, the markers are more narrow. They have to be smaller because of not interfering with trucks and parking and people walking by. So it, it's very hard to get a person's life distilled down to like three sentences. You know, it takes a little bit of knack to do that. But, you know, editing, working for lawyers for 40 years, you learn how to write better. <laughs> edit, edit, edit. And a comma can change the whole meaning of a paragraph. You know, so um, luck luckily for me, I was in in track one English all through school, so I like diagramming sentences. <laughs> so anyway, this is her marker, um, one of the first, um, America's first women editors. Uh, she actually edited that magazine for like 40 years, and she always wore black. She, her husband died when she was young and left her with all these children, and she used to edit a magazine in Boston, and Mr. Goaty, they invited her down here and asked her to be the editor here. And she always wore black. But she also petitioned President Lincoln to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. 20 years of petitioning, and they finally did it. And so she also wrote, Mary had a little lamb. Little, she wrote poetry and things. But those were just a few of the ones you'd recognize. This is Ethel Waters, the Broadway star um, singer. She was known as Sweet Mama Stringbean when she was young, and that's what she looked like. I think very elegant, beautiful. That was her later in her, after her years in Broadway, in the 30s, 1930s, she was the highest paid Broadway performer, which is hard to believe, but so she was a woman. Um, this was another play she was in called A Member of the Wedding. That's Julie Harris, and she was really young. I don't know. Maybe some people might not even know who these people are anymore. Um, but anyway, this was in Chester. She was lived in Chester at 3rd and Dock Streets, which is a really bad area now. But we put the marker up. There's an Ethel Waters Park there right across from City Hall in Chester. And so um, I put that up. Actually, I just learned last week that it was hit by a car. And so I notified the state, and they have to go pick it up. And we have to raise the money again if it's not covered by someone's car insurance, if it was a hit and run or something. So I hope that there's a police report. <laughs> um, so anyway, that was hers. Um, 
But she started singing. She was a maid at Swarthmore College in the beginning. And then she went and started singing in nightclubs in Philadelphia. And then she went to Baltimore, which is unusual. She went to Baltimore first, and then she went to New York. And when I was researching her, I found out that she has a, she was a, a star, you know, Hollywood Walk of the Stars that they have out there. She got one um, years ago, it was approved, but nobody ever raised the money to put it in for her. And so I called them up and I said, you know, how much money do you need? You know how much money it costs for one of those stars? $25,000. I said, bye, I got enough to do here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> but I thought it would be nice, but somebody said, oh, you should call right to Oprah or, or um, you know, Ellen. Maybe they would do it, you know, because it seems a shame to not have her star there. She was another one. She was married, never had children. She became religious in her later life and wrote a, My Eyes on the Sparrow, or a book. Um, and this is uh, Dr. Stephanie Qualick. She invented Kevlar, the bulletproof vest material. They use the, uh, it's like felt almost. It's used for brakes for trains, around your oven door, little things that you would take for granted. But she developed it in, for DuPont. She worked there for 45 years. And she lived in New Kensington, outside of Pittsburgh. I went out there, and I, this was where her house used to stand. In the background, that brick building up on the hill, that's a church. It's a Polish church. She was Polish. So I walked over and I asked the priest if he would come and say something at the dedication ceremony. And he said, yeah. And he came and he actually said something in Polish. And we put the Polish prayer on the back of the program. <laughs> so that's a picture of her when she was younger. I got in touch with her executor because she had to, they had to be deceased. She had just died in 2014. And so I put this marker up in 2015. Now the state has changed the rule. The person has to be deceased for five years now before you can do it. So, but this was her funeral program. Her executor came to the dedication and gave me some little personal items of hers. And she told me she, did, she donated two of her dresses to the Smithsonian Museum. And all of her papers and other personal belongings are at the Salt House at the Hagley Museum right across the border into Delaware because she worked for DuPont. Um, did, I said, oh, I would have loved to have spoken with her. And uh, the lady said, you couldn't have. She had Alzheimer's when she got older. But her mentor had said she wanted to become a medical doctor, and her mentor in school told her to become a chemist. And so she did. She became a chemist. And later in life, they said, you know, you helped more people by being a chemist than you ever would have helped as a medical doctor. So, and that was the Alakiski Historical Society out there. And my sister would go with me. I would pick three locations because sometimes they were in a railroad right of way and it was, you know, it had to be open. So I would always have to have different locations in case one fell through. And this is hers. But, um, what, what I had to do was raise all this money for all of these. And so in the beginning, the state would give you a grant of $1,000 if you got a 501c3 organization to be your sponsor. So in the beginning, I would go and find different women's organizations, ask them to be my sponsor. The state would give me $1,000, and then I would raise the other 1000 And that's how I got the marker. But then during the recession in 2008, the state took that off the budget totally and I had to raise all of the money myself. So in 2013, I needed the marker for um, Grace Anna Lewis, and I had only raised $5,000 of it. So I thought, and I would, you only have 14 months to put the thing in the ground. You know, you have t the 14 months to raise that money. And I thought, I had like two months left, and it was November. And I thought, nobody's going to have me come and talk in December, because people have their Christmas parties then. They're not going to want to hear me speak. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I wrote to Jerry Lenfest, who is a philo uh, philanthropist. He owned the Philadelphia Inquirer. He started Comcast. And one of my friends used to be his farm manager. So I called my friend, and I said, can you get me Jerry Lenfest's contact information? He said, yeah. So he got me his address and everything. So I wrote to Mr. Lenfest, and I said, I needed $1,500 
and you know I needed it soon and I told him what I was doing I sent him like a business plan in a folder newspaper articles and um, within a week I had a check for $25,000 in my hands and Mr. Lenfest said that I was to use it in three years just for women's markers and so that's how I got most of the money and it freed me up from going around doing talks to raise the money and I submitted for those three years I submitted seven proposals at a time, and the state approved four out of the seven, three years in a row. And that's how I got those markers. So I went, because I had been researching women's history for years, I just went down to my office and I opened the filing cabinets and I would be like, she's a definite, she's a definite. But they were at, all over the state, so I had to start planning, oh, I need money to go out to Pittsburgh, you know? And so I, um, when we would, my sister and I would arrive in these towns out by Pittsburgh, they're like, oh, we thought you would have arrived in Mr. Lenfest's private plane. <laughs> We're like, no. So we had to raise, you know, I had to use my own money to do the transportation and lodging, pay, you know, I said to my sister, I'll pay your meals and all, so I had somebody to come with me. Um, so that's what we did. But they re rolled out the red carpet everywhere we went. If the historical society was closed, they would unlock it, let us in. You know, they would take us all around the town, showing us different places. This is where you should get, you know, put it here or put it there. So they were really good to us. So anyway, that's hers. And I'm, I regret that we didn't put Dr. Stephanie Qualick on there. You know, I don't know why I wasn't thinking of it then. But anyway, her, it's, the marker is that piece of ground where her house used to be was up for tax sale. And so I was like, because I have to get the owner's permission to put a marker in. And so I um, called, you know, the city, and I'm like, uh, I, I guess I'll buy the property for the, at the tax sale so I can put the marker on it. And they went around for like a month, and then they called me, and they said, don't worry about it. The city is going to buy it, and you can put your marker there. So that things work out all the time. You know, you have to be flexible. You have to deal with all these municipalities. You always have to go and um, ask them to put dig the hole to put the marker in. And sometimes... They'll have like plans for a traffic light or a stop sign going in, and you don't know that. Like for um, Dr. Ann Preston's, I had to wait an extra year and a half because they put a stop sign there. But because I had to wait so long, they put a pull-in section for me so people could pull off to the side of the road and look at the marker. So you just have to compromise, you know. And anyway, that was hers. And then this is Jackie Orms. I found her in a children's coloring book. It said, Jackie Orms, Monongahela. That's all it said. And so I started researching her, and she was a syndicated cartoonist for the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier uh, for 50 years. And I mean, never heard of her. And that's really hard to be a syndicated cartoonist for all that time. But what she did is, I have a whole, I bought this book, it was $35 used, but it was, um, all her cartoons are in it, in color. And, and this was Torchy Brown, and she depicted black women to be not like Anne Jemima. She depicted them to be educated, wore stylish clothes. This was Patty Joe and Ginger, another cartoon that she did. Patty Joe and Ginger were two sisters. The sister was always telling her what to do. And she actually made these Patty Joe dolls, and that's her putting the, she hand painted all the faces. Another one, she was married, but she never had children. My aunt has a doll hospital, and she does doll repairs. And I said, if you ever see a Patty Joe doll, you better get that for me. <laughs> it's probably hard to find. I'm sure they were a limited amount that she made. Um, anyway, that's her marker. It's in this um, park right near, on, near the Monongahela River there, outside of Pittsburgh. And so, um, Fortune Brown, it just basically says, she grew up there. The people I met her aunt, um, so I met people in her family. It was nice to meet. It's nice when you do these markers and dedication. You get to meet the family members. Sometimes I look in their eyes and I think those eyes look just like that woman's eyes. I mean, I really do think they do have certain traits they inherit, you know, from their ancestors. And um, this is Ruth McGinnis. She was a, a world champion billiard player from Honesdale, Pennsylvania, up in Wayne County up going towards New York. So I went up there, 
Her father had a barber shop and had a pool table in it. She was playing in the pool. But I love the outfits <laughs> that she wore. And uh, when she, by the time she was 10 years old, she was traveling around the United States with Willie Moscone, playing in, playing in all these tournaments. So I felt she definitely needed a marker. She played um, against Babe Diedrichson. Um, she became a, a special ed teacher later in life. Another one never married. And then this is the barber shop in Honesdale where I put the marker. And I thought, oh, a barber shop. Her father's barber shop was down about four or five storefronts, but it was a hearing aid place now. And so when I saw the barber shop, I thought, well, I asked them. So I walk in, and it's a woman owned barber shop. <laughs> the woman said, I'd love to have it out there. So the marker is there in front of um, this store. There it is. It's one of the small ones. But it's, uh, she was the women's pocket billiard champion uh, of the world from 1932 to 1940. Uh, the best US woman player for over 30, 30 years, and inducted into the Billiard Congress of American Hall of Fame. And then it just tells about the other. And then that's her, her father's pool hall. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was way up in, in the mountains, you know, up there in Honesdale, if you've ever been there. It's a little town. But people would say, what made you pick our town? And I said, because I knew it was going to be a definite. You know, they thought I was, like, in love with their town or something. It wasn't. It was just geographically I had to go there to put up the marker. And this one is for Dr. Alice Evans. Uh, and this is in Neath, Pennsylvania, up in uh, Sullivan County, I think it is. Um, and this was the Susquehanna Collegiate Institute where she went to high school. This is the only remaining building left on the whole campus up on top of this mountain. And so um, I put, there's a YMCA there, so I put the marker there uh, because she was a scientist. She discovered brucellosis, which is a disease which causes cows to miscarry. And so um, she had said, oh, I found this disease, and nobody listened to her because she didn't have a master's degree. So she left working for the United States Department of Agriculture, went to the University of Wisconsin, got her master's, went back to the Department of Agriculture, and again said, I discovered brucellosis. And so they finally said, oh, OK. And they realized what she was trying to do. And so um, they made her president of the, pen, of the American Ma uh, Bacteriological Society, first woman. And she's listed in a lot of who's who in American science. She's listed in with all the men, the only woman. So, because there were no who's who of American women scientists yet. So she had a really tough time. Um, another one never married, never had children. And, um, Bacterial, I just said all that. <laughs> um, the next one is for the Slinky toy. Uh, this is a picture, the inventor of the Slinky, Richard James. Uh, that's him and his son. He's going down the stairs. This was the where they made the original Slinky. This is in Clifton Heights in Delaware County. This little plant is still there, but it's used for something else. Um, but this is the woman that took over the company. Um, I'm trying to think of her first name. Betty. <laughs> Betty, OK. Um, but the husband said they, they became millionaires because he had invented this little, he was at work, and this coil thing that he was working with on the ships. He worked for the, the Navy Yard. And he brought it home, and he was playing with it. and. She picked the name out of, an, of a dictionary. She picked the name Slinky. And so they went and sold them at Wanamaker's in Philadelphia one Christmas. And they sold out immediately, and kids loved it. So they became millionaires, and they ended up, he went to West Town, the husband. And they ended up moving to the main line and lived in like this 32-room mansion. But then the husband started giving away all their money to like charities, missionaries, and stuff. And he came to the wife, and they had six children. And he said, um, I do not, uh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to South America. I'm going to live in a mission, as a missionary. You can have the company. So she took over the company. And that's when they came up with the slinky dog. Um, and that kind of turned the company around. The company was almost bankrupt. And she saved the company. 
And so, and there's stamped just to show you a close up what Slinky looks like. But anyway, that was, um, I contacted the family and th uh, the three children were still alive, three of the six children, and they all came to the dedication. Um, but the one daughter was only three years old when her father left. She said she never really knew her father. Um, and so, but the Slinky Company came to the dedication and they brought free Slinkies for everybody. It was really nice. And um, that one, I had to raise the money myself. Got one, I didn't have enough money in time, so I had to throw in $500 of my own money on that one. So, you know, sometimes you just, I just, it's not worth going around and raising the money. I just have to do it. But anyway, that one's now in Clifton Heights on Baltimore Pike, down there on the corner. And then this one is for uh, Rosalie Edge for Hawk Mountain. Uh, have you ever been to Hawk Mountain, Berks County? Pennsylvania used to pay, pay a bounty for every hawk that was killed, like they would give them $5 or something because they were considered um, you know, detrimental to a farmer's crops. They would um, go after their chickens or their, their birds and things. So. Um, they would pay this bounty. And Rosalie Edge was a New York socialite, and she was very involved in uh, the conservation movement and the Audubon Society. And so she saw these photographs of all these dead hawks. Which some of them are called ghost hawks, like the hawk with G-O-S in the front. It's a different time. It was a little smaller of a hawk. But anyway, that's Rosalie Edge. And um, so she decided to come down to Hawk Mountain, and she decided to rent the whole mountain to keep people off the mountain. And she hired uh, a married couple to be the caretakers. And slowly over time, it became a sanctuary for all the raptors, the eagles, and hawks. And I think now is one of the best times to go up there, September and October, because that's the mating season. And they do these big, long spirals. And you're above them, so you can look down and see them doing that. It's really nice if you ever go up there. But you see that um, dragonfly pin on that woman's shoulder? At the dedication, her granddaughter came, who's older than I am, and she had that same pin on. So it was nice to see the pin, because that's, that's a famous photo. It's in her biography. But I went up to uh, there, you know, met with the people at Hawk Mountain. Um, and I put in my nomination, I said it was the first ha uh, Hawk Mountain san Hawk Sanctuary in the world. And so the state rejected it and said, prove to us that it was the first. <laughs> so they gave me like a provisional approval on that one. So I had to go back up to Hawk Mountain, meet with the scientist. He just handed me a book and he said, your answer is in this book. He wouldn't show me where. So I had to read the whole book. I said, do we want me to look in it now? And he said, no, take it with you. So anyway, I found it, and I resubmitted it to the state, and they gave me the approval. But it was considered the first in the world. So, But that's her, I think I have another one close up. But um, So today they have all kinds of programs up there. They have hiking, they have programs for kids, and lots of things. You know, if you look on their website, they do counts. Um, how many hawks they see that day, or how, any kind of bird. They keep account of everything. So that's hers. And then I said, I have, tw I have 25 of the Pennsylvania, the blue and gold, these blue and gold markers. But I have four of these. These are purple, gold, and white. And these were for the National Votes for Women Trail. These are done by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, Mr. Po Dr. Pomeroy had invented some kind of diabetic medication. And so they paid for all these markers. They approved five markers for each state out of the 50 states because women, this was during the uh, 20, 2020, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And so it was supposed to be this big thing, and then COVID hit. And so we still went ahead and put up these markers, even though we didn't get a lot of turnout because of COVID. And they were all paid for by the Pomeroy Foundation. This one I did for um, Jane, Jean Kane Folk, lived in Westchester at Bala Farm. That farm was also used on the Underground Railroad. It was a boarding school for children. Um, but this is one of the places where they trained women during World War I for the Women's Land Army. And 
now there's a big development with these nice McMansions in there, but the original house is still there and the people live in it and they have a little bed and breakfast out in the back. They have a library. It's a stone library um, that, the, that was used during the school. It was like a private family library. But that's where they, they use that as a B and B. So they wanted a marker on their property. Um, some people don't want it, and if they don't, you have to move it like a block away. That's what I do. Most people do want it on their property, but there are some that are very private and don't. This is for Hannah Patterson out at Wilson College. It was a women's college for years, recently made co ed in Chambersburg, um, right near Gettysburg. So, um, she was very involved in the uh, Pennsylvania Women's Suffrage Association. Um, she was a trustee at Wilson College. And so we put her marker up, and that, that was in November of 2020. And then this one is in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. This, the first Women's um, Suffrage March, 1913, went in Williamsport. There was a discussion. You know, everybody said, oh, no, it was Erie. And some people said, no, it was Williamsport. But it was Williamsport. Erie was later that year by a few months. They were both in 1913 now. But the Justice Bell, I don't know if you know anything about that. It was a bell that they had tied the clang clangor to the side. It wasn't going to ring until women got the right to vote. And so they went around the state, every all 67 counties, uh, the suffragists. And they even had a... a a dog, a mascot, um, so they were really into it. They had the, the bell there. And so we went up and oh, this was 1915, that's where it went through, the parade, August 11th. And so when I go to all these towns, I end up making friends with all these people. And so the woman that I, for these markers, I would call somebody in that town and say, would you like to do a marker with me and do it jointly? So you can submit these jointly. And this one I did with Mary Szymanski. She's an author in Williamsport. She wrote for the um, Williamsport Gazette for years. She's a, a little older than I am. And, um, but she's, she was very happy. Now we're working on another one of, for the blue and gold ones. So <laughs> we've become really good friends. And I think nothing to drive into Williamsport now. It's, it's like three or four hours, not too bad. So anyway, that was my last slide. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, One thing about this is, you know, I got invited to speak on a radio show in Westchester, WCHE, 15:20 a.m. Paul Rodeval, have you ever heard of him? He was the Chester County historian for years. And when I forgot the first three markers, he said, you know, he called me, "Why don't you come on my show?" And I was like really nervous. I wasn't used to being on the radio. I'd never been on the radio, and so. Um, I went on and we were on the air and then he said, look, why don't you come back next week and we'll talk again. So I went and I was on another hour the following week and I started listening to the radio station in my car. And so after that last time, he and I, he said, let's go. We went out to breakfast at the Westchester Diner and we're sitting there and he said, what you're doing is cutting edge. And I said, cutting edge? What I'm doing is 150 years late, Paul. And he said, no, no, it's very important. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. And he said it with such, like he wanted me, like it was urgency or something. And I just thought, oh, what a, yeah, OK, I'll do Keep doing it. So <laughs> I left that night. And the next morning, I'm driving to work. I hear on the radio that he died during the night. And I was really sad because I thought, oh, my history buddy, he's gone just that quick. So I drove to, I went into work, and I said to my boss, I've got to go to the radio station. He goes, go, go, you know. So I ran up to the station. I walk in. I said, I can't believe Paul. He's gone. And the owner of the station, um, he looked at me and he, he said, uh, you know, why don't you take over Paul's show? And I said, oh, I don't know anything about radio. I started backing out of the station. <laughs> he said, well, what do you know? You're real cocky. And I said, all I know is women's history. And he said, get on there and talk about women's history. And I ended up doing the show for six years. And so that's what I mean, like being in the right place at the right time, it's like coincidence, my girlfriend says, is the handwriting of God. But you know, it, it was just the right place at the right time. I think it made me a better public speaker um, by being on the air. You know, 
So it was fun. It was an experience. A lot of good things, like the thing with Mr. Lenfest, the $25,000. Never thought I would do something like that. You know, so things do, good things do happen. But every year I still, I have like four that are waiting to get put in the ground because now, because of COVID, there's a backlog of orders for all these markers. And I don't know what the holdup is because they, they can't weigh that much. They're like, uh, you know, steel, the pole is steel, but the top is um, fiberglass. So I don't know why there's a big holdup. But so I'll send you guys an invitation to the Historical Commission when I get the next ones put in. You can come to our dedication. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Fourteen months to put the marker in the ground. We have to start again. It happened to me several times. Because I had one for Mary Ann Shad Carey, African American woman in Westchester. They approved it, but I didn't raise the money in time, so I had to go and start again. And when I submitted it the second time, they wouldn't approve it. So I didn't know why, and I, I called, and they said, well, the lady that was here before was really big into African-American history. It's all political. So I don't know really what the reason. I submitted it three times. And I've actually talked to people in Westchester. The, um, the Westchester historical people, or historic Harb or whatever, they're thinking of doing the ones on the buildings and getting one for her there. Because uh, I, I, she was the first. Uh, African Amer first woman publisher of a newspaper in North America, and you know she was from Westchester. She went up and lived in Canada at the end station on the Underground Railroad. Came back and recruited black soldiers during the Civil War for the for the Union Army, and then she went to law school in her old age and became she was the second woman African American woman to get a law degree. So I I think I don't understand why they won't give me the marker. Mary Ann Shad Carey. She's from the Shad family. Abraham Shad, he was an abolitionist, one of only three abolitionist black men in Chester County that were, uh, he was a shoemaker and he dealt with um, Thomas Garrett. Thomas Garrett sold um, leather and stuff. And I, we think, oh, they must have had freedom seekers, you know, in the wagon when they had all these t hides, you know, they would use to make shoes. So we think that's what they were doing to get them out. And I did, in my book, I did try to put, I actually had to go to extra expense, but I put the color, um, color pictures in here because I thought if a woman never gets to get, go and see the marker, she'll see it in color because Beatrix Potter, she wanted her books to be child in color and to be able to be held in a, in a child's hand. So I had things I wanted to do, and I thought, no, women appreciate stuff like that. So, but there were a lot of things, even with the um, when we did the play for the uh, 1852 convention. Um, I found a mistake in the in the history of women's suffrage. The one person I could not find in that play was Eva Pugh, and I thought I could not find any bibliographical information for her, and so. Somebody gave me the original, um, the proceedings of the original convention from the Library of Congress. And when I looked through that, I thought, found Eva Pugh. It was Evan Pugh. It was a man. And he was the first president of Penn State when it was called the Agricultural College. But he was only in his 30s. He was young then. And he went to the Women's Rights Convention. And I thought it was important to have a man um, support women's history, women when they were back there trying to get their rights. So when we had to write a few men into the play, the women in the play were, no, we don't want men in our play. And so I said, no, there were men there, let's have the men. So we did, I got my brother-in-law and a couple guys I knew to come in and they played the parts of the men. So, but that was, there's a typo in the history of women's suffrage in one of the, in one of the volumes, if you ever look in there. There is no Eve appeal. And sometimes I wonder, they said, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they might have done those things deliberately. They left the men out <laughs> and changed it to a woman's name. But anyway, just another tidbit. <laughs> but thanks. Thank you. <laughs>